engine performance one test ten. So I can get on the screen. Um, now then, let's start here with uh, this first multiple choice question. Which statement below is correct? Most ignition systems work by switching the circuit grounding the ignition coils primary. What's that? Is that true? What's the ignition coils primary? The primary? You know what the difference between a primary and a secondary is? Drop it back to this old kind of coil right here. The primary is this side. The secondary is where the spark comes out. You got it? Even on a relay, the primary is where the trigger is taking place. The secondary is where the work's done. It's the same way as here. The primary being you're causing something to happen here, and the secondary is, you know, indirectly, you know, firing because of that. Uh, so this one here has got a set of points up here in the distributor, and those points do this, and every time they do this, that coil actually is saturating its windings, and when they open, that uh, magnetic field collapses and it causes the spark to be generated on that secondary side. Okay. Most ignition systems work by switching the circuit to power the primary winding. That's not so. The reason, you know why they're saying most? Because, you know, the, you know, these hot rod cars have got this MSD ignition. You know what I'm saying on that? Those actually do switch the prime. I mean, the positive side, believe it or not. Uh, the ones I've seen do, I mean, all of them are not. Most ignition systems work by switching circuit to power the coil secondary, but none of the secondary is not handled anyway. So A is the right answer on that question right there. That right question right there is A. And I got a copy of that thing here. Okay, which of these terms are specified by the Society of Automotive Engineers as a term describing an ignition system that does not use a distributor? Is it DI, IGN, EI, or ND? I think it's DI. It's actually going to be, uh, no, it's EI. Is that what you said? I said DI. I'm yeah, no, DI is the distributor ignition, but EI is uh, what you, if it doesn't use a distributor, which is this counter right over here, or coil on plug, they got cop coil, you know, COP too. But the ignition system module or pickup coil or a trigger is usually connected to what? What is that? It's when it, in other words, it's connected to, it actually is, they're not asking for the location of it, they're asking what it's connected to, and that's a kind of a crazy worded question. Okay, the pickup coil is in here, right? Okay, because of the pickup coil is in here, it's actually, grab your, uh, did you, will you have a copy of this over there? Yeah, yeah. we're just getting started. But the pickup coil is in here, but it's connected to this. Now the distributor, the module on this Ford was way over on the fender, and this distributor was obviously in the front and center of the engine. So there's wires, you know, that far over there. But never the pickup coil, at least the, the two, the purple wire and the orange one here, was going to the purple and the orange on this one here, and that's uh, the module is what it's connected to. So that's the right answer for that one there. That's A. Okay, what is the term used to create high voltage using volto, low voltage? Somebody give me an answer. Is it a electromagnetic induction, electromagnetic magnification, electromechanic uh, induction, electromagnetic multiplication? We talked about that. B. Now it's actually going to be an A because it's uh, electromagnetic induction. Those big long words can trip you up sometimes. All right. All right, so... Uh, now, what can you tell me about that? What was I talking about over here a minute ago in this call? This call, and this call, and that call, and this one up here, they all use the same principle to make a spark. Now, what does that mean? you got a magnetic field that's saturating some copper windings, and whenever, the mag whenever something causes, if you, the reason you've got that is because you've got a complete circuit. And when you've got a complete circuit, uh, with current flowing through these windings, it's actually going to cause a real strong magnetic field. And when you break that, you know, it, it causes that spark to jump out of here. Let me show you. With, I may as well grab a, a wire and do this since I'm here anyway. All right, now if I do the, you might notice on this one here, I'm going to the, to the B plus, and then I'm going to go on through the B plus to the, to the coil positive. 
and my distributor. See that? All right, now every, the reason that's happening is because when those points, when you open those points, the moment you open those points, I can actually open the points with my screwdriver and make that happen if I do it right. If I can make that push over there. See that? Because that was a screwdriver. It's difficult to do it up here. You know, we used to bend over and do it under the hood of the car. It was fairly easy to get right on right. But anyway, that's actually causing, you got a, a winding that's small, uh, like, has a few a few wet wraps, like maybe a thousand, and then you got another one that's got a million. <laughs> and the million windings are little teeny tiny wire, and it, it actually takes the, uh, multiplies the, you swap it some voltage, I mean some amperage for some voltage. This right here, these typically, the uh, amperage that go into this winding is limited to less than five amps. And the hey, module, hey girl. Huh? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, how you doing? Hello. Can I have you just two seconds? Yeah. Maybe five seconds. Yes. Mm -hmm. One kilogram out of endless. Oh. I'm looking for a vehicle of this type in Iowa. I've left a brochure at uh, the police department and high school. You remember any car? This is not the actual car, but it's a 76 Monte Carlo. Did they get stolen or something? No. Uh, what happened, I took my mama's 73 Chevrolet Impala to a, a, a mechanic shop in Redville. Mm -hmm. He swapped the engine out of that 73, uh, 73 Chevrolet with this 76 Monte Carlo motor. Really? So uh, it's proof. Yeah. So I'm trying to find him get my 94-year-old mama out. Okay, sure. Uh, my cell number's on there and everything. If you see one, holler at Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was a tangled web, wasn't it? Somebody took the engine out of another car and put in that one, I guess. What we're, do what we're doing on your car is we're uh, putting a different oxygen sensor on there because when you jump in and out of closed loop, it's when you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, he was doctoring another oxygen sensor. Huh? What's that now? Oh, do that. Yeah, jump on my girl. Yeah, she was helping me with my work here. All right, but anyway, uh, what's going on there? Uh, the module is what limits how much current is fed through there. What did you find over there? The inertia switch was tripped on it. Oh, and that was simple as power. Mm -hmm. Who did that? Did they crank it run? Well, the battery was pretty hot. Whenever I tried to spin it over, so yeah. I never. Yeah, you played it on lower? Yeah. yeah. Well, put your safety glasses on. If it blows up, you'll have a new experience to talk about. Oh, wow. Just make sure that you stay out of the way. If you're spinning it over from inside the car and it blows up, it won't matter. Yeah, but I got to do it right outside. Of well, put on, see that face shield? <laughs> they think it's going to blow up. In a minute, we're going to go boom, boy. All right, now then, so we were on um, number four electromagnetic induction is the right answer for that one. Technician A says the primary and secondary ignition systems are never connected. Technician B says the primary and secondary windings are connected in some ignition coils. That's actually technician B. In this kind of ignition coil here, the primary and the secondary are not connected to each other. As a matter of fact, the core is actually between them, but they're not actually connected to each other. On these, one end of the primary is connected to the secondary, so which is a different kind of a setup. But this is different than this. These aren't connected. These are okay. And that one there is another one where you know where it's connected. Uh, also, you might notice this little laminated core that they got around these things. Anytime you want to increase a, the strength of a magnetic field, you got to go around a core. If you got an iron core around it, it's going to make it stronger and all that. Okay. See. Let me see. Uh, technician A says the primary coil has more windings, which is false. Technician B says the secondary coil has more windings, and that one there is number, the number six has B. You got that? Okay. Seven, the following statements are correct except A, the direction of the primary windings in an ignition coil determines polarity. Is that right? When an ignition trigger is closed, voltage should only be available at the positive coil terminal. Okay, when we're talking about the ignition trigger, the ignition trigger is right here. All right, now I'm going to read voltage here. When the trigger's closed, that's when the points are closed. Now, this same thing is done in these modules. they got transistors, but this, these points are actually the mechanical way of doing that. Is there a test light in here somewhere? Anywhere? Right there? Let me see that. 
Here, I'll go here. All right. If I go to my ground, and that's what this is talking about, I'm going to go to ground here, and I'm going to hook this back up again to that. And we're going to turn that. Did I not start? I need a relay. The relay is missing out of it. Uh, reach over there and uh, and snag one. You know that little box where we did our... Uh, that, there's a little project box that's got three relays in it. One of them broke loose. Just plug that one in there and see if you can make it work. And we'll put a different one in it later. You see this right here? See that? How we're, see that robbed enough juice from that the current from that coil of vertical fire when I got out of there? But see how that's splashing? That's what that's supposed to do whenever you got to. See that? But when that's closed, I don't see anything. But when it's open, I do. See how it's opening and closing? How that works? That's how that's working right there. So, anyway, take it off. If you just leave that hooked up and those points are closed, this coil will get really hot. But you notice I got a resistor, a ballast resistor, and the, the use, this is in series with this. So that this is, you know, even there it says 12 volt, use external, external resistor required. Some of them have got a resistor in them. If they do, it'll tell you that on the side of the coil. If they don't, and you don't have a, a resistor on here, you're going to usually burn the points up or something else, you know, on those. Now, some electronic ignition systems, the early ones, like this right here, this electronic ignition came out in 1972 on the Dodge and the Chrysler and all. It used a coil just like this. This, this kind of electronic ignition came out in, with a Ford in 1974, if I remember right, and it had a coil like this. But General Motors, the, the earliest General Motors electronic ignition that was widespread was the one like what's on that 350 out there, and it had that coil built into the distributor cap. So they, it, as soon as General Motors won electronic ignition, they got away from these old round oil filled coils, and they went with those square ones, which are kind of like this, you know. That's a General Motors, it's like a 94 model, that's what this setup right here is. That's the thing that sticks up out of the intake. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just mounted on the intake. Uh, but uh, the, the other thing that I always love to do here, and I've showed you all this a bunch of times, but you know, for the if I take a my hand up here and do this, see, I'll, 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 I'm the pickup call. It gives enough current through my body to where it thinks that the pickup call is telling it to fire, and that little circuit in there is popping that. And, uh, I learned that from a female GM instructor a long time ago when I went to school the first time. You know, that was handy as your pocket. Um, a lot of times, if you've got the pickup, if you've got the distributor with a pickup call, you can pull the trigger on your, uh, I'm going to try to say, pull the trigger on a soldering iron and hold it up there and it'll make it go bzzz, you know, too, so it gets confused by any kind of electromagnetic interference. I'll tell you something else that happened one time. My, uh, this lady that I knew called me one time about the time I was getting ready to leave Ford. Uh, place over there, and she said, My uh, old mobile, she had a little old mobile, 86 old mobile station wagon, and it had a uh, four cylinder in it, throttle body injection. So that's one of them where you can take the top of the breather off and look at the injector. And so she said, It quit when I pass it across over the traffic circle, and I'm down here at this convenience store. So I said, I had to leave work by that time anyway, I'm close to being quitting time. So I just punched out and I went over there. And we, I took that top, you know, she cranked it up and it, you know, acted like it wanted to start and it died. So I took the top off the air cleaner and I could see the fuel squirting from the injector. You've seen that a little, you know. Well, whenever she fired it up, it started squirting fuel and then the engine stalled and it kept squirting fuel after the engine stalled. It was just buzzing that injector or something awful. And I started smelling something and it smelled like a burned up motor. And I looked down there and the fan motor was running because she had the defrost or the air conditioner or something on. And there was smoke starting to come out of that motor. So I unplugged that motor and I said, start it up again. And she started up again it ran smooth. I said, okay. So uh, I plugged it back in. I said, turn off your air conditioner or your defrost. Put everything off on your climate control. She did that and it ran smooth. And I said, now turn on your air conditioner. She did and it died. And I said, you need a fan motor. That's what's wrong with this. Now, get, where I'm getting at with that is that was electromagnetic induction. It was causing all these waves of magnetism to sweep through the engine compartment, and it was inducing current in these wires that wasn't supposed to be there. And the engine controller is just, just as sensitive as this, and it was picking every one of those up and saying, and it was needing to squirt fuel at fault. 
because that fan motor had, you know, if you could actually had some kind of a way of measuring that electromagnetic interference in that engine compartment, it was nasty. And so that's a lot of the time what you can tell. Something else we used to do years ago was we would, uh, if we had an idea that there was some sort of electromagnetic interference causing a problem or, you know, like RFI from a spark or whatever, we would turn the AM radio all the way down to the bottom end of the band and turn the volume up really loud and drive down the road. And when the car bucked and jumped, if it bucked and jumped and you could hear popping or static on the radio that went with it, you'd know that, you know, you were using the radio for uh, indicator for RFI. In the Vietnam War era, they had a low AM radio band radio in the cockpit, if, I, if what I read was true. And whenever they got painted with radar from a sound site, they'd hear static. So that was, they would just hear that muffled squawking sound of being painted with radar. It would pick that up real good, you see. All right, so, uh, but anyway, uh, technician B says the secondary coil has more winding, and he's right about that. That's number six is B. The following statements are correct except what? The, uh, the direction of the primary windings in the ignition system determines polarity. Let me stop there. If you hook the ignition coil up backwards, like I could move this up here, would that coil fire? If I hook this up up here, and would, it, would that ignition coil fire? If I, you know, like that. So I'm going to hook that up there, and I'm going to go through my ballast resistor. I'm coming off of power right here. I'm going to go through my ballast resistor, and then I'm going to take my this other wire here, and I'm going to hook it to the side of the coil that used to be hooked to the distributor. Now I've got the polarity reversed. If I turn that distributor right now, is that coil going to fire? It fires. Ta-da! Now, is that a surprise to you, you know? Now, I will tell you this, if the polarity is reversed on a coil like this, the car won't run right because the spark won't be as strong. Furthermore, um, the ignition scope pattern will be upside down. <laughs> when you hook your scope up, your firing line will be pointing down instead of up. My dad could look at the spark on his Volkswagen bugs that he worked on. If you plug those little, they were just little spade connectors that you plugged in, you know, to the coil. And it was really easy to plug them in backwards because people just plug them in, you know. And if the one was cutting up, wouldn't run right, and they had that polarity reversed, you would, I mean, he could look at the spark and tell if the polarity would reverse on a bug. He was just looking at the spark, he could tell. And uh, and he explained it to me, you know, that you'd have like a, a little orange sort of a torch looking uh, sheath around the spark on those, and the little point of the blue part in the center of it, kind of like you're looking at it on a torch. If it was pointing one way, it was in there right, and if it was pointing the other way, it was wrong. So he could just, his eyes were good enough to those in those days, I mean, he's 80 years old now, but he would turn that thing through, and he said, that polarity's reversed, and he'd turn it around, the car would run right. <laughs> and sometimes the car would have been all over the place, you know, and he would fix it with just some little something like that. It was simple. Okay, uh, but anyway, uh, when the ignition trigger is closed, voltage should only be available at the positive coil terminal. You know, we're going up here, I mean, backing up. Uh, the primary windings of the coil should have continuity. What should I read right here with a meter, do you think? I got a meter? I got a meter in here somewhere? This right here, the primary windings on one of these kind of coils, like this one right here, three-tenths of an ohm. That's the primary winding, three-tenths of one ohm. If you read two tenths of one ohm, that coil won't fire. So it's real, real critical on that. Yeah, that was something that you know I used to deal with at Ford all the time. And you know every coil's got slightly different specs and all that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, primary one is the coil should have continuity. That's true. Switching the positive and negative leads up to an ignition coil could cause a coil to produce a weak spark. Uh, that is uh, the one that's. Uh, that's supposed to be the right answer here. Um, when the ignition trigger is closed, voltage should be available, only be available at the positive coil terminal. Well, that's true, but they're claiming that B is the right answer for question number seven. This answer key is wrong. Um, what they meant to, and I mean, I don't really like uh, any of this. The primary windings, uh, the direction of the primary windings in an ignition coil determines polarity. That's, you know, 
bound to be right there. But switching a positive and negative leads based on what I just told you, you get a weaker spark. It doesn't look like it, but you get a weaker spark that way if they're reversed. However, there was a bulletin that came out that Ford put out that said on this kind of coil, it didn't matter. And that was, I plainly remember reading that for years. I was thinking it's a polarity reverse because that's what I learned working on my dad. That you should never reverse the polarity because it will be weak. I mean, you have no reason to anyway. But that Ford said that that right there, that kind of call right there, so yeah, the scope pattern would be up down, but it's upside down, but it, it ain't going to make a car run bad. That's not what we're doing with it. Oh, so you still got no fuel pressure? Yeah. Okay, see if the fuel pump has got, get, pull your fuel pump relay, or you know, it's over there on the other side. You know where it's at? In front of the master cylinder? Mm -hmm. All right, and hook your test light to hot. And go to the one that's feeding the pump and see if it lights that light. See what I'm saying? You're going to see if you got a ground coming all the way through your pump winding. Uh, if you don't, then let me know. And we'll have to go from, you know, we'll have to pursue another path. That's a good, that's a good bug for you. Because you're probably going to see that sooner or later on something else, you know. And all that, but so, test light it. Um, you to the hot one. Put it on the hot one. You'll put it on the hot one. And the relay that, the relay that uh, I mean, the normally open terminal on that ISO relay, and it's one of my ISO relays, it should show our ground. If the inertia switch isn't tripped and the fuel pump's good and the ground is good, feed the pump, you ought to see a, you know, it ought to light that light. Just like that. If it don't light the light, then you, we may have a bad pump, but what we need to do, we'll have to go back there and the pump, you know, on the front of the tank on that one, so it ain't hard to get to. If you raise it up, you can see the pump is right there. And we'll have to make sure that the pump is good. We can check it back here. If we have to, we'll jumper box it, see if the pump will run with power shot straight through it. See, that's how we'll do that. Find you a test lab do that. Um, okay, uh, so number seven is sort of, if, if you want to get that one right, you'll put B, but I don't like that answer. You know that. Uh, number eight, which statement below is correct? Turning on the low voltage primary coil induces a high voltage in the secondary winding. Turning on the off the low voltage primary coil uh, introduces. What, you, what means when you turn it on the coil? You're going to saturate, right? When you break that saturation, when you break the circuit and it collapses, that's when you get that. Remember what I told you about air conditioner compressor clutches creating a voltage spike? They don't even have a primary and secondary coil, and they create a voltage spike if you don't have a clamping diode there. If you've got a clamping diode that's connected between the hot and the ground on one of those air conditioner, you know, compressor clutch coils, uh, then you don't have a problem with that. But if you don't have that, and that's a, a, like a 400 volt spike will come screaming out of there. Because when you de-energize that air conditioner coil, the magnetic field that was created by the coil collapses across the coil itself and creates a doggone spike that comes out of there and it will fire something up. If it ain't got that clamping diode, or if the diode's bad, or somebody took it out, it can mess up an engine controller. Uh, I saw one on a bucket truck that belonged to Dale Cable Vision. They had one of them kind of clutches operating a power takeoff for their hydraulics. They didn't have a clamping diode in there. And if they had the radio on, and they had the engine running, and they turned that thing off, that spike would go screaming back through the wire harness into the radio. And the radio could put up with that about 20 times. But on the, you know, between 20 and 30 times of it doing that, the radio would just go completely dark. And it was just a plain little AM FM radio. And that car, that thing would come in, radio don't work. Well, radio had power and ground, wouldn't work, put another radio in, everything's fine. You know, two weeks later, they come back and say, radio don't work. They put another radio in it, and they says, can you find out what in the sound bill is going wrong with these radios? So we done put about four of them in this truck under warranty. And so I got my oscilloscope. And I hooked to that doggone radio, the power, you know, going into it. And I kept, I started turning stuff off and on, you know. I said, let me go with what they put added. And so when I turned off that power takeoff, I turned it on and the hydraulic pump started spinning. I turned it off. I saw a, sp a spike that went slam off the screen. And it was screaming right into that radio. And that radio was getting, you know, jumped and jacked upside the head with it. And so I, all I did, I got a little teeny tiny diode, like one of the ones you see me playing with, a little black, a black looks like a resistor, but except it's black with a white stripe. And you got to put it in there the right way. you got to put it with the band toward the positive so that it can't short out. And when I done that, no more radio problems on that truck. And that was, you know, a lot of stuff you do in an vehicle is going to be fairly simple like that. Okay, one more thing. Give me a second here. Uh, let's see. Uh, did you have a ground, by the way? Mm -hmm. You did have a ground. 
Okay, if you take and jump or power, is it, you got power going to the door, to the common terminal on that relay? If you got power going to the common terminal, that's good and strong. Jump power, even without even starting a car, you got a fuel pressure gauge on it. Mm -hmm. All right, jump power directly into that pump and see if the, you hear the pump running and the pressure comes up. And if it does, then you'll know you got a problem with the primary side of that relay. You get me? I mean, so all you got to do is you take your jump, you know, strip, strip your wire and make a loop. And let's see what that does. And where does it go from the normally open to the common? Uh, yeah, just from the common to the normally open. That's all you got to do. Yeah. All right. Um, the uh, primary coil lenses are made of, uh, oh, excuse me, number eight is supposed to be a B. Uh, which statement below is correct? The primary coil windings are made of thinner wire than the secondary windings. That's false. The secondary coil windings are designed for higher current, two to six amps. Well, that's, you know, I said five. Well, we go two to six, that's not true either. Uh, the primary coil windings have more turns. Nope. And the primary coil windings are designed to handle two to six amps. Oh, one more thing. Let me tell you something else that's idiosyncrasy. On this particular ignition system here, if you've got this thing just turn on the key. This thing here has got a dead short to ground on that coil all the time. If you leave one of these switched on, when you walk off and you leave the key switched on all night long, then this coil is going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. And it'll work tomorrow morning, but it ain't going to be right. And it's going to be weak. And I've seen that. Somebody, he left the key switched on on his truck or whatever, talking to somebody, whatever the guy did. He got out of it and he walked away. And when he came back, he says, well, I found out I left my key on, I jumped it off and it wouldn't run worth a flip. And I drove it and you know, it cut up and carry on. Whenever you snap the accelerator pedal to the floor, they go bum, 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 you know. That usually means you got bad spark plugs. I mean your spark plugs are wore out, you know. If your spark plugs are wore out when you snap accelerate it without it being in, in gear and if it sputters and pops on the way up, you can put some plugs in it. Or you got a weak ignition coil, or maybe the coil wire between there and the distributor cap. But this thing right here uh, had, got, had got really, really hot and was partially compromised internally. And so I put another coil on that one and fixed it. Another way I could tell that was when I was checking the spark, it was really weak. You see, okay, so that, that was a little fix on that. Remember, this kind of ignition module here is like it. Now, these other kind aren't that way. These right here, because they're not made to handle very much uh, current, these, they, these smart electronic ignition modules are not going to send the ground over there at all until they're ready to fire the coil. This one here is kind of a dumb one, you know, and it just sends it over all the time. That's not a problem when somebody leaves it on all that long. What's the name of the electronic component inside the ignition module open and closes the primary, excuse me, the primary ignition circuit? And what do you think that would be? Transistor. Transistor. And then a semiconductor. And you, under, you guys understand the difference between an NPN and a PNP transistor, right? Positive, negative, positive. Well, it's, it depends on, you know, uh, a PNP transistor sends power to something when you ground the base. Uh, NPN sends a ground something when you put power to the base. So it's got to be different. You see this right here? That right there, and you can see it, is a transistor. It's a power transistor, and that's what fires the coil. And on that one right there, and I'm going to take the time to... Just take a few seconds here to show you this. you will let me know if you get bored and ready to go to lunch. And I'll just keep you a little longer. All right. And we'll take that right there. All right. That right there. Is that going to fire that up? Now we'll pull this off. See that? I'll get a spark up. Why don't I? I'm making a break and I want you to look at a spark. I do this and the spark on. I've got no... I got no condenser, I got no capacitor. Now I can take a capacitor. You can make a little box to check an ignition coil with a capacitor and a push button. Be careful, I might be doing five you. All right, now I'm going to take this right here. That right there, going my nose, I'm taking the power going through here. Now I'm going to take another power wire and I'm going to run it to this wire right here on this little Chrysler ignition module. Okay, so on a Chrysler ignition module, we'll be hooking it here. Now the green wire, I always like to use the appropriate color, is basically going to be hooked to the coil. Right where that way. Remember that? All right, then we'll fire this. See that? What do you think about that? Now, if I take my test light, 
Look at here. What do I see here? See that? See how I'm touching that? There's a lot more going on than that. I'm actually causing this power transistor down here to do its little thing. All right, now, let me ask you this. Can I take this ignition distributor out of a Ford and fire that Chrysler ignition bolt? That wouldn't be programmed up exactly. I took that right here and I hooked it to this Chrysler ignition coil. And I take another one. And I'm talking about to the orange and the purple. And I hooked it to the Chrysler ignition coil right here. And I turn that through. It doesn't know the difference. But you know what would happen if you tried to do that on a car? And I'll tell you how I know that. I'm a part of a, I'm a sort of a, of a experimenter. And back in 1980 or 81, I had a Ford pickup that had this kind of ignition on it. And I was impressed with the Chryslers. This almost never failed. But these went out all the time. This was a better unit than that as far as reliability. The Chrysler distributor, the little reluctor in here with a little star looking thing, it had sharp pointy little um, ends on it that would go past a sharp pointy little pickup coil. This one here on this Ford has got fat ones. In other words, the, 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 edge of the, the reluctor on this distributor shaft, they're kind of fat. And so what I did on that pickup of mine, I got one of these. Daniel's about to turn into a skeleton over there. I got one of these. And I, I wired it up on my 74 Ford pickup truck so that this coil, I mean, my pickup had points in it when it was new. Well, I dropped a Ford distributor in it, or you can't fit a Chrysler distributor into a Ford. And I put the Chrysler, I did not have one of these, but I happened to have one of those and a wire connector. And I know how to wire it up because it ain't complicated. See that? Coil, battery, and there's your pickup coil. See how I put that on there so that everybody would know? All right, so. I wired that son of a gun up just like you see it right here. And that engine would not start unless I retarded the timing. I retarded the timing, and when I pulled it around, if I pull the timing around, it would run good. So I could start it up, and I could drive it with this and that. But every single time I started it, I had to pull the distributor around and retard it, like it was a Model A or something. You know, in Model A, you had to retard the timing before you could start it. If you didn't retard the timing and you got out there and started spinning your crank, you'd, it would kick back like it does when the time is too fast, it'd break your arm. So you had to move that lever back and retard the timing. Well, on this one here, I had to do that same thing. And after I drove it a little bit, it actually burnt that module up, so, or it quit running. And, uh, you know, at the, time, at the time, I was just frustrated and irritated anyway, and so I put a timing chain in it and, you know, put the ignition system back like it was and all that kind of thing. But anyway, uh, that's a, a little treatise on ingenuity. Didn't work out well for me. It was a jerry rig, which is the, the shown way of doing things. <laughs> but I had a tendency to be that way too. The jury rig thing only works well if it works well. Does that make any sense? The jury thing is only advisable if it works well. If the jury rig doesn't work well, you need to try something different next time. This jury rig blew up in my face and didn't work well. I learned things and when you tell people I had a Chrysler module and a Ford distributor and I was driving my truck like that, they were like, no. Sure enough, they really didn't figure it would work. And it really didn't, but hey, I'm trying that. And it did better when the engine was running fast enough, see, and this was a brief enough signal. See, the, the, pat, the, the waveform was a little bit different, you know. But anyway, I, did, I could, you know, waste all kinds of time talking about it. Anybody got any questions? That, that finishes up our little short class session for group one. That it? You ready to go to lunch? Did you have a nice nap? What happened to you this morning? Did oh, you have a bad morning? Okay. All right. Then. Well, I will see you guys after.